Raise your hand if you have meditated with success. Ah, oh, a lot of hands dropped. Okay. Let's just be honest. Meditation has a huge image problem. And I've been in the meditation space for about 15 years, starting off as a practitioner. And then I apprenticed my teacher, my meditation master, for many years. And for the last eight years, I have been traveling around the world to different cities, teaching people from all walks of life the basic mechanics, the, the physiology, and the biology of meditation. And the general consensus is my life would definitely be better if I meditated, but it's too hard. I can't quiet my mind. I can't sit still long enough. I don't have the time. So I want to shed some light onto what I feel are the five most common meditation myths in our society. And I want to give you guys some tips that will help make your meditation practice instantly more enjoyable. And I want to show you how you can use meditation to literally create more time to be more productive and, of course, to change the world. But first, I want you to uh, close your eyes. And I want you to imagine in your mind's eye a white polar bear. And hold your attention on this white polar bear in your imagination. And then open the eyes. Okay. Raise your hand if you got distracted and you thought about something other than a white polar bear at any time. Now, that was about half the room. Close your eyes again. And this time, I want you to let your mind roam free. And you can think about anything you want to think about, as long as it's not about a white polar bear. <laughs> Whatever you do, do not think about a white polar bear. It's very important. Go. Okay. Open your eyes. Raise your hand if you accidentally thought about a white polar bear. <laughs> Raise your other hand if you thought about it a lot. <laughs> Almost everyone. And that brings us to our first myth that I want to talk about, which is that I'm a bad meditator if I can't quiet my mind. Now, that white polar bear experiment that we just did was an actual study that was conducted by a Harvard psychologist who wanted to see, is it possible to suppress certain thoughts? except they didn't sit for a few seconds. They sat for five minutes trying to focus on the white polar bear and then for another five minutes trying not to think about the white polar bear. And just like you, when they weren't supposed to be thinking about the white polar bear, they ended up thinking about it a lot and some of them were bordering on obsession. That's all they could think about <laughs> was the white polar bear. And the conclusion from this study was twofold. Number one, if you focus on anything after about five or six seconds, your mind is going to naturally get diverted to another unrelated thought. And number two, if you try to suppress your thoughts, guess what's going to happen? You're going to end up creating more of the thought you don't want to have. So suppressing the thoughts does not lead to a very positive meditation experience. Now, what they started studying at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology are these styles of meditation called non-directive meditation techniques. These are actually very old meditation techniques, but they've just started studying them. And these styles of meditation aren't using the white polar bear method of suppression. Instead, those meditators are allowed to let their minds drift and wander from one thought to the next. And And what they found was that when you allow your mind to wander from one thought to the next, you actually get to a very high degree of mental and emotional processing. The other thing they found is very interesting, that a wandering mind leads to a rested mind. You activate this rest network that can actually get your mind and your body into a state of rest that's deeper than the one you get when you're sleeping at night. So... Sitting comfortably and letting the mind wander is actually going to not only cause your body to rest, but it's going to bring a high level of orderliness and efficiency to your mind. So the thoughts you're having aren't obstacles to your meditation. They're symptomatic 
of your mind actually working on autopilot through the problems that you're having in your life. The next myth I wanted to uh, dispel is this whole idea that there's no correct way to meditate. We've all heard that before. And it's a bit tricky because I believe that all meditations lead to the same goal, which is greater sense of inner peace and happiness. But there are definitely best practices that will allow your daily meditation to feel a lot easier. And easy, again, is a subjective term. But here's what I mean. I'm going to tell you a little story just to illustrate this. And I'm a little bit embarrassed to admit this, but I didn't learn how to swim until about nine years ago. Long story short, I was hanging out on a beach with five women, and uh, we were surrounded by these volcanic rocks, and they wanted to go skinny dipping. And I was single at the time, so this was like a golden opportunity for me, except I couldn't swim, and there was no easy entrance point to the water, so I had a dilemma on my hands. And because I was afraid to admit that I couldn't swim, my response to that suggestion was, oh, I'll, I'll just hang back and watch your clothes. <laughs> and so needless to say, the next day I signed up for swimming lessons. <laughs> and I go to the pool, and the coach asks me to swim across the 25-meter pool. And I get in, and I start doing my best impression of what I think a swimmer looks like, except I was just dragging through the water And then I got about five meters out. I started taking water in. I could barely breathe. And this 12-year-old lifeguard almost had to jump into the pool (laughs) to to save me. And I was able to luckily get to the side of the pool before that happened. But the teacher took me to the side and she says, you know, you actually have the perfect body for swimming. You just need to get longer. And you need to torque your body like this. And you need to kick like that. And you need to make sure you're breathing in this way. And she was teaching me the basic mechanics of the freestyle stroke. And when I'm teaching meditation, and I ask someone to show me what, how, how you've been meditating, and what they do is they, they do their best impersonation of a monk, right? <laughs> they sit on the floor with their legs crossed, they bring their fingers together, they don't know why, they just do it. <laughs> and you, you can see their brow crinkling up here, they're just straining. And I'm not saying that this is an incorrect way to meditate, but for for a beginner, your meditation experience is going to seem like my swimming experience. You're just going to be dragging yourself through your thoughts, and it's not unusual for someone to come out of that experience feeling like meditation is too hard. It's not for me. So instead of sitting like this, I encourage people to sit like this. Sit comfortably. Have your back supported. Use pillows. And what you find is that your body is not a distraction to the process. So if you're brand new at meditation, you want to sit like you're watching your favorite television show. And then if you employ those mental techniques of allowing the mind to wander and drift, you're going to have experiences that are a hundredfold easier than anything you've had before. Then you just have to do it consistently enough, which brings me to the next point. I don't have time to meditate. Right? You've heard this one a lot. There's only one activity that I'm aware of that will actually refund you back the time you spent doing it, and that's daily meditation. Here's what I mean. We all have a chronological age, and we have a biological age. Your chronological age, of course, advances once every 12 months. Your biological age speeds up or slows down based on how much stress you have in the body. This is a picture of my personal hero, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. This photo was taken during his last speech, the mountaintop speech, which was the day before he was assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee. He was 39 years old in this picture. And when they did the autopsy on his body, famously they said, if we didn't know that was Dr. King, we would have thought that was the body of a 60-year-old man. All the stress and the pressure he was under aged his body nearly 20 years more than his chronological age. And what's come to light recently in the last 30 years or so is that meditation has a reversal effect on biological aging. There was a study that was published in the International Journal of Neuroscience showing that if you had a matching chronological and biological age on your 30th birthday and you started meditating daily, by the time you were 35, 
you had the skin elasticity and the sexual responsiveness and the auditory threshold and the vision and the memory of a 23-year-old version of yourself. In other words, your biological age was seven years younger than you were when you started meditating. So saying, I don't have time to meditate, is kind of like saying, I don't have time to file my tax refund where I was going to get back half of the money that I paid out. The next one is meditation will solve all of my problems. You've seen these people running around uh, and evangelizing about meditation. And I'm going to contradict myself here for a moment because if you dig deep enough, you can find all kinds of studies and claims showing that meditation does all wonderful things like reversing your biological aging and resting your mind and body. And there's studies that show meditation will help you curb your chocolate cravings. It'll help you drive better. It'll give you mind-blowing sex experiences. It will help you win the Super Bowl, apparently. And there's a lot of correlation here, but we're kind of light on causation in my personal opinion. The problem with these kinds of studies, uh, to me, is that it's not possible to weigh all of the variables that were involved in a particular study. There's one study that gets cited a lot in meditation circles, and I've cited it before myself, and it involves meditators showing up to a lab room, getting connected to electrodes, right? Now, a lot of you guys meditate. Imagine you show up to this lab, they have you take off your street clothes, put on hospital gown, you go sit down in a chair, it's a steel folding chair, it has a hole on it, and then they connect electrodes to your scalp. And then they put a gas mask analysis machine over your nose and your mouth to measure for oxygen consumption. And then they put an oculogram on your eye to measure for eye movement. And then they put a reference point on your earlobe. And then they put a cardiogram on your heart to measure for heart rate activity. And then they stick a catheter in your arm to take blood samples while you're meditating. And the other palm, they put a galvanic skin response device to measure for sweat. And then you feel some petroleum jelly underneath your butt. And they take a rectal thermometer and they slide that up into your butt to measure for body temperature because all the other orifices are being used for some other kind of measurement. And then they tell you, okay, relax and meditate. Of course, everybody who was in that study reported having horrible meditation experiences, and you would have too, and I would have as well. But what was interesting is that when they looked at the meta-analysis from that study, and they saw the results in their physiology, they actually had very positive changes. And they ended up coining this term from this study called the relaxation response, which gets cited a lot when people talk about the benefits of meditation. The next one is... Success in meditation is based on the stillness of my mind, right? Meditating successfully has nothing to do with how still your mind becomes, so you just need to get that thought out of your head now. Nobody got that, huh? Okay. <laughs> how do you gauge progress in meditation? If I'm sitting in meditation, I'm having all these thoughts, how do I know I'm successful with meditation? A lot of the times you won't know you're successful, until someone else realizes it in you first. There was a woman that I taught to meditate back in New York City, and she was in her 40s, she was a lawyer, very type A personality, and she came to me and I gave her everything she needed to be self-sufficient, and I told her with time and with practice, you're gonna have some positive changes, which is all I ever tell people, because I don't know what's gonna happen to them, but I know that whatever happens to them is gonna be amazing. So she goes away, she comes back a year later, and I'm teaching another group of people to meditate. And I get to the part about the positive changes, and she lays into me. And she says, Light, I came here a year ago. I've been meditating every single day. I haven't noticed any positive changes. I don't think meditation is working for me. And I said, you know, um, I'm sure some positive things are happening in your life, but a lot of the times you won't see it first. And by this, besides that, we don't know what's being prevented because you're meditating, and that needs to be considered as well. And so she leaves a bit disappointed, and she sends me this email six months later. And she says, Light, I have this story that I think you'll find very funny. I was out to dinner with my husband recently, and we got into one of our regular arguments. 
where I was right and he was wrong, you know, the usual. (laughs) And I was just able to let it go and continue enjoying my meal. And then about 20 minutes later, when he was sure that the argument was dead and buried, he said, honey, three months ago, if we had an argument like that, you would have left me in the restaurant. And now you were just able to let it go. He said, I think that meditation's working. (laughs) So that's how we wanted to find success in meditation. How much more adaptable are you being in your life? And meditation is going to cause that that little gap, that little moment, that breath that you take just before you were going to honk the horn or that moment of reflection just before you were going to say that thing that you would have regretted five minutes later. My teacher says, you know, never miss a golden opportunity to keep your mouth shut. (laughs) So let's do this, everybody. Let's close your eyes one more time, and I want you to just kind of settle in. Just start to notice your breathing very gently. You don't have to control it. Just notice it. And I want you to expect your mind to wander off at some point to some other thought, maybe about the chair, about your body, about the time, or something you're going to do later on tonight. And when you are aware that you've wandered, you just gently come back to noticing your breathing. All right. Slowly open your eyes. Isn't that so much easier than fighting the mind and doing the whole white polar bear thing in meditation? Literally, just 10 minutes of that. 10 minutes every morning. And you will refund back some of that wear and tear on your body. And you will bring more orderliness and efficiency to your mind. And you will cultivate inner peace and happiness. And you will feed that out into the collective consciousness. We don't live in isolation. So however we're feeling inside is going to ripple out through our universe, through our community. And so... That's our personal individual responsibility. Every single day, we're feeding something out into the collective. And my message to you is just to let that be peace. Let that be happiness. Let that be the highest expression of yourself. Thank you very much.